and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, let me bring the screen down. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I want you to notice that phrase, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That same idea is mentioned in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 4. So let's bring that up for you to read. Hebrews and the fourth chapter. Right near the end of this chapter. I'll read the last couple verses, verses 15 and 16. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now remember, Jesus went through everything we go through. He was tempted in all points. But being the example that he is to us, he was without sin. And so we can look to him to see how he went through instances like that. And that's good to know that that's the kind of high priest we're dealing with. Let us therefore... Because of this, this is the kind of high priest we have. We don't have to be afraid of him. Therefore, come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now, did you catch that? Find grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We can find grace too. It reminds me of that verse, straight is a gate and narrows the way and few there be that find it. You have to find it. And, and if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you're going to be filled. If you hunger and, and are desirous of finding this grace of God, you will find it. Noah found it, and we can find it. Noah found it in the eyes of the Lord. We find it at the throne of God. Now put that all together, and you're going to see some powerful connections in the book of Revelation with this. You might already be getting ahead of me now that I mention that. But the eyes of the Lord, even the prophet said, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth to find those to whom he can show himself strong. Now, if he's looking with the eye, his eyes through the whole earth, looking for people through whom and, and to whom he can show himself strong, his eyes don't miss a thing. So if your heart is reaching out and you feel that you have a need and right now, this world is in a need. Uh, this is the time to let our light shine. When we can have faith and confidence going through this, the world sees that. And, and it's letting our light shine. People are themselves. The real people come out in the times of trouble. Uh, a lot of times, people are putting up a, a front, a, a thin veneer of something that's covering what's deep inside of them though and and under pressure we are what we are and so we need to recognize that god is looking and we need to just we don't have to raise our hands your little heart will just raise a hand up to god and let him know i need you and so i want to take this message and apply it to what we're going through right now right around the world and and let's just believe god father in the name of jesus christ i pray lord your your word that we're going to share here today just gets through to everybody, gives them confidence that there's a throne we can go to. And, and people look to their leaders. Lord, you are our leader. And, and we go to your throne. And what greater source of strength and support and encouragement can we get than by going straight directly to the throne of God? And, and I thank you for it. I feel your anointing, just thinking and talking about it. And let this cause everyone to be able to hear what your spirit is saying from this word that we're going to give forth. Help them to be able to hear. In the name of Jesus Christ, we believe you for this, God. So these scriptures show a common theme of finding grace. Noah found it in his day, and the church is able to find it. We've got a high priest we can go to, and Jesus is his name. And 
we come to the throne of God. There is where we find grace. Now, Noah found it in the time of trouble. God's throne is there for us to find it. Now, think of this time of trouble. The world at Noah's day was so wicked that God had repented that he had even made man on the earth. And it was he was uh, looking back and thinking about it. It just grieved him at his heart so much. But Noah found grace. In other words, Noah was seen by God. And I'll tell you, God was really proud to be Noah's God. Because looking at the whole human race, can you imagine what that must have felt like to if Noah would have known all that and, and had that uh, sense and discernment to realize what was happening? The whole world grieved God. But there's a man standing out amongst them all that found grace. And now here we see a type of Jesus Christ. Because of all the world, the only begotten Son of God. He was the one without sin. And talk about finding grace and so forth. But that's an encouragement to us because if you've been listening to the Spirit in the last several years so far, talk about listening and hearing, there's one thing that God's been really emphasizing to the body of Christ around the world, and that's our identification with Jesus Christ. That we experienced his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We are identified with him. He initially identified with us to die in our places. And after that, it, it is upon us to identify with him. And when we recognize we died, we were buried, and we were risen with him, even seated together with him in heavenly places, Ephesians 2 and 6, that is going to give you so much faith and strength I don't know how many times I've repeated this so far through the years. Ephesians says, the power that God used to raise Christ up from the dead and put him on the throne, the third day experience of Jesus coming up from the grave, after that, the 40th day experience ascending into heaven and sitting on that throne, those two things are done by the power of God that's toward us. The same power that raised Jesus up, the same power that enthroned him is on us. And if we remembered that every time we come across a cloud in life, a dark time, a storm, and realize we're seated with Jesus far above all principalities and powers, every name that is named, and not only in this age, but in the age to come, that is the kind of power we have going for us. And Remembering that, there's where we identify with Jesus Christ. We are co-crucified, co-buried, co-resurrected, and co-seated with him, sharing that power. Co-anointed, you could say. We just won't have his deity, that's all. But we've got his, his victory over death, hell, and the grave. And so Jesus, you can see a type there of Jesus, but then you can also see it with us. But there's something else. We go to the throne of God when we look. You need to find grace. Something else is similar in Noah's story as well. Let me go there now to Genesis chapter 9 this time and bring out some more similarities. Down to verse 12. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For perpetual generations, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. Think of hardships. Think of hard times. Think of what we're going through now. There's been a cloud come over the earth. And God says, when I bring a cloud, the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy the all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, this is the token of the covenant, which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Praise God. God says, I'm going to send clouds over the earth. I'm going to continue to do it. 
And every time there's going to be a bow in that cloud, I'm going to set it there. Now, the first time this ever really happened with Noah's day, there was no cloud with a rainbow at that point. Rain, this, this was a judgment that happened for the first time. We don't read anything about that. But that rainbow is associated with God's grace. Now, think about it. I'm not going to destroy the earth anymore by the waters of a flood. That's grace. There's a covenant involving grace that he's talking about. I believe we're in the new covenant, and I believe that's what the Bible refers to as the everlasting covenant. All of these things pointed to what we have now in Jesus Christ. And so finding grace is mentioned in connection to this rainbow in Noah's day. Finding grace is mentioned in connection with coming to God's throne in our time of need. Now, our day mentions a throne in association with grace. And the book of Revelation puts both of these pictures together. Watch this in Revelation chapter 4. The word of God is so wonderful. And the second and third verses. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And this was a bit of a different kind of rainbow. An emerald is green. And it's like shades, rainbow uh, hues were around the throne, but in shades of green. And all through the word of God, they even use green in the world today to signify life. But green represents life. A living rainbow, some people call it. And so it's so wonderful to think that we see grace associated with a rainbow in Noah's day grace associated with the throne in our day. And then in Revelation, he puts it all together and there is a rainbow around the throne and that's where we go to to find grace. And it's important to understand that rainbows are seen after the storm. When you're going through the storm, it's like finding grace. You've got to find it. The rainbow's there, grace is there, but it is in need of being found. And the storm is over, and the, the rainbow really shines at that point. But you won't see it till the storm is over. Now, clouds come and go in our lives all the time. We go through it. They say every five years on an average, there's a crisis that really, if you didn't have a hold of God, it would cause a breakdown. And there's some crises that God lets us through, that maybe a, a damaging and a breaking does occur. And I always remember the words of Watchman Nee I remember reading so many years ago, words I never forgot. That woman brought the alabaster box. Alabaster is such a, a precious, expensive container of perfume and, and broke that for the, the perfume to come out and the oil to come out. And, and I think it was Judas criticized her. He was the money man, had the money bag. Think, Look, you, we could have taken that jar itself and sold it for some money. And Jesus said, you leave her alone. There's that precious thing that was broken. And, and our flesh can be so precious to us. We try to defend it at all costs. It's what feels this fear. Our flesh is what feels this danger. And, and it's what is affected when we go through these dark times, when the clouds come. And, and yet being broken allows something inside that's so much more precious to flow out. And it's the same way. In fact, if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you read Paul making reference to Gideon when he talked about the light of the knowledge of the glory of God shining into our hearts. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And then Paul starts talking about that earthen vessel, talking about our flesh made from the dust of the ground, the earth, going through persecutions. But Paul said, I'm not being destroyed. Cast down, but I'm not being forsaken. Going through such hardships, 
but I'm not forgotten by God. In fact, he said, it makes the anointing come out of me in a much more greater measure. And he said, you people in Corinth that are fearing for me, going through what I'm going through. He said, this suffering is but for a moment. It's not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. When that breaking occurs, that beautiful anointing comes out. She was anointing Jesus' feet. And, and anointing Christ after she broke that alabaster rock. An anointing comes out of us. When we go through this breaking, Paul said, I've been beaten with rods five times. I went through a shipwreck. And no wonder he made that statement. He said, I glory in tribulation. And you know, he gloried in tribulation in more ways than one. He, I believe, exalted in going through tribulation, being counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. But literally inside of him, glory was coming out. He gloried in the time of tribulation. I never thought of that before until I just said this right now. God's talking to somebody. God's giving somebody strength. When you go through this breaking, glory comes out. You can glory in tribulation because the suffering for this present time causes the breaking. It reminds me of the veil. The glory of God was behind the veil in the temple, the holiest of holies. And when Jesus died, when his, his earthen vessel was broken in death, the veil ripped at the same moment and the glory shone out. And, and just as with Jesus, look what Jesus' death accomplished for us. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul makes reference to that and says, I'm finishing up the suffering of Jesus Christ in my body. In other words, I'm continuing on the tradition. I'm being broken. So like what came out of Jesus will come out of me. And he said, so the last thing those Corinthians had to do and worry about was Paul. He said, I'm being persecuted, but that's okay. I'm not cast down. I'm not forsaken. In fact, he says, it's so that the glory may be of God and not of us. In other words, when they saw Paul, go through what he went through. They knew a normal man under normal conditions would feel forsaken being broken like that, would feel that he was cast down and, and done away with. But to be able to keep going and not be cast down, not be forsaken, shows God has to be with that one. So the breaking was for the glory of God. That's what was coming from Paul's life when people looked at him, knew what he went through, and just got up and shook the dust off and kept on standing for God anyway. I can't get over what I'm feeling right now talking about this. What an anointing God has that when we stand and go through these hardships and we're breaking and him so proud over his children going through. Remember what first what Hebrews rather chapter 11 talked about when the gave the roll call of the heroes of faith. It talked about Abraham and Moses as seeing him who was invisible and and these all desired a better country because the place they were in, they didn't want to put down any roots and that's why Abraham remained intense. He said the world wasn't worthy of these people. God looked down on them and said the world's not worthy of these people. And, and I'm sure that's what he thought of Noah when he saw Noah. The world's not worthy of people like that. And you know something? The world's not worthy of you. It's not worthy of you. But God in his great vast wisdom, he would just as soon as take us. He did that with Enoch. But the world needs to see that in us. The world needs to see this glory so that when we're broken, we glory in this trouble, which is the root word of tribulation. My, oh my, God is such a good God. And so these times of trouble, clouds come in our lives, dark times, when otherwise there would be light. It's so that something's going to be seen. A rainbow's going to come forth and be visible. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 now. And I always think of this verse too. When I go through a hard time, and I encourage the folks in church about it, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will. Now there's a solid affirmation there. Will. He will. And we're reading the word of God now. We're not reading the opinion of a man. This is God saying, I will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape. That sounds to me like there's a rainbow in that cloud. Now, we think 
that exit from this temptation, that escape, is doing away with the temptation, doing away with the cloud, doing away with the storm. But the last clause in that verse says that's not the case. You're, you're reading this wrong. That you may be able to bear it. Paul was able to bear the being cast down, the, the being persecuted. He was able to bear those things. And that is what brought the glory of God out. So number one, God won't let you go through it if you can't take it. So if you're taking it, if you're going through something, God knows you can take it. We need to believe these words. God knows his church can take what's going on right now. And the enemy's even blown it out of proportion more than what it is, probably. But not only that, it's a pat on your back for you to go through something that's very hard and strenuous because God knows you can take it. And, and so being able to bear this Read these words in a different light. Same as 2 Corinthians 4. Uh, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the glory may be of God and not of us. So that when people see us in such a victory, with such an attitude. Now, let me interject at this point, which goes right along with what I'm saying. Our tempers and our jealousies and our grudges and our angers and all of those things the cross gave power to overcome those things. Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, we that are crucified, we've crucified the flesh with its affections and its lusts. Now, it takes spiritual maturity to get to that place because when you first get saved, a lot of your fleshly weaknesses are there. If you were an impatient person, you're impatient when you're born again, but it's now your need of overcoming it. Just like when Israel came out of Egypt, they still had Egypt in them and they were wanting to go back. Anytime trouble came up. And, and so that needs to be overcome. And that's where spiritual maturity plays a part. Where we overcome. He that can conquer his own spirit is better than a man that can conquer a city. Our attitudes, our hates, our grudges, our lusts, all these temptations, they're signs of immature spirituality when we don't change and by overcoming those things where they used to be in us, and people don't see it anymore. That's true spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity is not laying hands on the sick and everybody that's blind gets healed. They can see and casting out devils and performing wonderful works and prophesying. Jesus showed us that in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 down. He said, many will come to me in that day and say, I've done this and I've done that. And he's going to say, I never even knew you. But he said, he that hears my word and does it. These people evidently weren't hearing the word and doing it. And a lot of that has to do with the work of the cross that they weren't doing. They wouldn't carry their crosses. Oh my, we can get off on a lot of that. But these clouds, temptations attack us, just like these clouds. And we can pass through them without being defeated. Oh my, God needs to give us a Holy Ghost word of anointing where we start shining like the lights were supposed to be by getting over our fears. And the world, see, bringing the world into the church has been just taken way out of proportion of what God meant when people don't understand his true intention when he said that. You know what the world in the church is? It's getting afraid the way the world does, as if there is no God. They don't believe in a God. They don't serve him. If they say they believe in him, they really don't, don't if they don't serve him. Uh... And, and without a God to lean on, they react the way, and we react that way. Uh, having anger the way the world has anger with people, no forgiveness the way the world has no forgiveness for people, that is bringing the world into the church. We've got a chance right now, folks, church. This is timely. We're right in the middle. The peak of this pandemic is coming within the next couple of weeks. And I'm talking about the peak, according to even how the secular studies are being made of it looking back and, and basing it on pandemics in the past. And we can let our light shine more than ever and have that confidence where people are going to be around, want to be around us, when we've got that peace past understanding where we're being troubled on every side, but we know we're not forsaken. We've just got that assurance. Thank you, God. And so just as God wouldn't send a cloud that would destroy the people of the earth again, there'd be a rainbow. God won't suffer us to go through what we can't take. So the clouds came at one day time in Noah's day with that storm, and man did get destroyed. 
But every cloud since then, God said, I'll never destroy man with it because I've got an everlasting covenant I've just established. So you need to look for grace and you need to find it just like that cloud has that rainbow. Grace is the most important thing there is. In, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now this brings out an important truth. We can apply that to when we're first saved from sin which is what everybody usually thinks of anyway. But think of destructions that would face us in our future after we're saved as believers, when we're cast down, when we're persecuted. God, even today, after years of being saved, gives me grace and saves me from destruction. See, that's what Hebrews was trying to say, chapter 10, verse 13, that you're, you're escaping the destruction. You're not escaping the storm. He wouldn't say that you may be able to bear it if you're going to not uh, even go through the storm. You'll be able to go through it. You'll be able to bear it. But the exit and the escape is from the destruction that it seems to bring to people who don't rely on God. Now, when Paul talked here about grace, he was saying it's not of us. It's of God. Grace, there's nothing for us to brag about. It's God. We are his workmanship, if you keep on reading. We get so proud of our workmanship, and we accomplish something, and we think, look at this world. I'm more holier than you. Well, it's a bunch of trash, because anything that's going to be uh, genuinely holy is certainly not going to be made by the hands of man. It's the workmanship of God. The work that we can boast about, Paul said, all glory in the cross. And there's the word glory again, with the cross, which refers to the destruction of the flesh. That's how we were saved. And we carry our crosses the rest of our saved lives. And we'll trade in those crosses one day for the crown, as the poet said. But it's God helping us. So Noah found help from God that he was being blessed with. No, there's no way he's going to get through that flood on his own. But God gave him that grace, and that grace was in the form of an ark that was built to just exactly the right proportions that would take him and two of every kind of uh, uh, unclean animals, seven of every kind of clean, all his family, eight of them all together, through that flood. Praise God. Grace is always associated, associated with God helping. And that's why Paul said, go to the throne to find grace to help in the time of need. You're not going to get through this on your own. You'll break down. Go to the throne to find grace to help in the time of need. Grace is in one place alone, folks. It's at that throne where Jesus is sitting. And he is king of kings on that throne. He is Lord of lords there. And you're going to get a great dose of help in the time of need through this grace if you go to him for it. And that's why the rainbow is around the throne in the book of Revelation. Praise God. Look at another scripture where the rainbow was located. This time I'm going to Ezekiel and the very first chapter in that prophet's book. Oh, God is so good. Thank you, Jesus. Look at verse 4. I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself and a brightness was about it and out of the midst thereof as the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Drop down to verse 26. You hear about the carabim, the wheel within the wheel and so forth. And in verse 26, there was a firmament, there was these cherubim, the lion, the ox, and the eagle, and the man. You read that in Revelation as well, chapter 4, verse 7. And over their heads was a firmament, a solid mass. And there was the appearance and the likeness of a throne. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Somebody's on the throne. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire. So amber, gold, was from his loins up. 
Fire was from his loins down. Read Revelation chapter 1. And look who's girt about the paps above his loins with gold. And look who has legs of fire as if they burned, legs of brass rather, as if they burned in a fire and furnace from his loins down. This is none other than Jesus Christ. From his loins upward, he had fire, uh, gold and amber. From his loins downward, the appearance of fire. And it had brightness round about. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Can you see what's coming together here? And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spoke. That's even John fell down on his face when he saw the one with gold from his loins up and fire from his leg. And, and Jesus reached over and said, Be not afraid. I was dead and I'm alive forevermore. John said, I felt like a dead man. There's a good, powerful spiritual picture there. He had been frightened out of his wits and fell like a dead man in fear. And he reached down and touched him. Be not afraid. It was a, I was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. John did the same thing in Matthew chapter 17 when he saw Jesus' face shining like the sun and a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. And they fell on their faces and Jesus did the same thing, touched him and said, Be not afraid, it is I. John saw that happen all over again in this vision in the latter part of his life. He was just a young man when he followed Jesus, and that happened in Matthew 17. Well, now he's an old man on the Isle of Patmos, and he sees it again. What a wonder. That, that's the Jesus he knew. So isn't it interesting? You're reading about Jesus in the book of Ezekiel. So he saw this cloud come. Now, every cloud has a rainbow attached to it. This cloud had a rainbow, but it was a very different cloud. You read about it, fire enfolding itself inside it, and carabim were there, and the crystal firmament with a sapphire throne on it, as the rainbow was there in the cloud around the throne. The rainbow was there, the bow. It had the appearance of a bow as it is seen. So Jesus is being shown as king of kings, with power over all and in every cloud that comes your way. He's on the throne right now. The fire might be enfolding itself. The tumult that people are experiencing, the earth is shaking and the cataclysms are breaking. But every cloud has a way of escape from destruction because there's a throne there. There's a, when you see that rainbow, think about the throne of Jesus Christ because there's a covenant that we have in effect. And we are in one unity with that Christ. Hallelujah. And, and he is there for us. Every temptation and danger and calamity has this escape. What's the escape? It's go to the throne. Find grace to help in the time of need. He will give you superhuman endurance and tolerance to go through what we're going through. That it will be God's glory. The excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And God just thrills to do this with us who are in earthen vessels, whose flesh, those earthen vessels, get cracked, get broken. But think of Gideon. I mentioned it briefly, but I didn't expound on it. Gideon was faced with his small, little, minimal 300-man army. The Midianites were out there, like grasshoppers, the Bible says, for number. And it was at night darkness at the darkest time. But Gideon heard from God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God's saying something to you folks. Right this afternoon, he's giving you a word. You might be in the middle of the night, darkness. And then here we are in the middle of this COVID-19 crisis. And, and you might have loved ones. I heard of a minister down in the United States, 55 years old, died with coronavirus, COVID-19. A man of God died through this already. And you might be healthy and you might be strong because they say it's those of ill health that are in danger and those over 65. God, Jesus would leave the 99 to go to just the one. Even if a sparrow falls, he notices it. How much more one of us is children. And so take it seriously in that sense. But at the same time, have faith with it that God's with us. Praise God. And he's there. We go to him. We get that strength from him and the excellency of the glory and the power. People realize it's not of them. 
that guy is proving that there's a God. You know what atheists need to see? They want to see a sign in the sky. They want to see something written. I am here. I am here. God telling them he's there. Well, they look at lives and they see us with this kind of victory in life and, and going through what we did. A brother, he's probably watching here now, Brother Norm, went through a thing. His heart was in such a serious condition, was so close to losing that precious life. But he went through it. And now he's saying things on Facebook that's encouraging other people. It's not the battle you're going through. It's how you react the way you go through it. And this is the case there. That will shut the mouths of every atheist. It's like when Jesus was on the cross. It boggled their minds when they heard everybody railing on him and, and screaming at him, the thieves mocking him. And, and he, what's he do? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And you might say, well, that's Jesus. I can't do that. Well, look at Philip in the book of Acts when they were stoning him. All of a sudden they saw the face of an angel and he lifts up his voice and says the same thing in his last dying breath. Talk about carrying the bruising and the breaking of Jesus in his own body. He was dying as he was being stoned and he was the first martyr as a Christian. And he said, forgive, lay not this sin to their charge. So it's not just Jesus that can do that. See, this is the thing. We think of what we can muster up to show our victory. It's not of us. It's of God. The excellency of the power is of God. You've got to have grace for this to ha happen. In other words, you have to have a reliance on his help. You have to have a strong, in intense awareness that you immediately go to him instinctively. Get it in you until it's like an instinct. It's the first thing you do is go to him in the time of need because we just break ourselves and we put ourselves through trouble we don't need to be going through because he's right there all the time you heard that song he was there all the time waiting patiently in line time after time and so forth i went to everything else but he was the last one i finally put and he should have done that at the beginning praise god so there's a way of escape a way is a door and jesus said i am the door i am the way the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And oh, if you want to get that way, find God, get a hold of God. In the storm, you've got to go to the throne. Everyone tries to battle their own way through storms of life. Even believers, the world does this all the time. But even not many believers go to the throne. They break down and they wonder why they're breaking down. They'd never learned to go to the throne. Find grace in the time of need. It's there for you. Go to the throne. A rainbow means the storm is over. And going to the throne, it's going to end your storm. That's where the rainbow is. You know what he's trying to tell us, spiritually speaking, in simple form? You need to get through this storm. You need to get to the end of the storm. And go to that throne where the rainbow is, because that's the end of the storm for you. Or the end of its destruction against you, at least. Either way. You've got it made. Now, sometimes people can be afflicted with serious, severe diseases, terminal diseases, and God will take it away and it'll be gone. I, I prayed bone cancer left a, a native Aboriginal chief who was a pastor in one of our meetings where we prayed from. Bone cancer was gone. Having meetings, uh, we cast devils out of people, set free, and couldn't believe the purity they felt in their souls. And then one man prayed for him. And he came to church the next night, realized when he got halfway down the road to the church, he didn't have his cane because God had healed him with his legs. He didn't have to get his cane. Sometimes God will take it away immediately, but other times he doesn't. Even one of the apostles' uh, assistants were left sick at one place, not healed. So even if we don't get healed, go through it anyway. And sometimes, folks... Just sometimes God gets more glory when the healing maybe isn't there, but you're still standing like a rock and it's not flinched your faith whatsoever. Praise God. Everyone tries to battle on their own. True faith that he is there to help you will cause you to escape the storms or at least the storm's destruction. And that's more important anyway. Noah found a covenant with God when he went through that flood. And on that mountain named Ararat, and how many know what Ararat means in English? 
Literally, its name means the curse is reversed. Wasn't it Lamech, Noah's father, that when he was born, he said about his son Noah, This same shall comfort us concerning the work and toil of our hands, because of the earth which God had cursed. And when Noah walked out of that ark and made that altar sacrifice, first thing he did, and then sent up an offering to God, it was a sweet savor to God. And he said, I'll never again curse the world for man's sake. Noah reversed the curse through his sacrifice. And there's the type of Jesus again. Jesus caused the Father to change covenants. 1,500 years of sacrifices under old covenant Mosaic law made the psalmist David rise up and say, thou art not pleased with offerings and burnt sacrifices and burnt offerings. Lo, in the volume of the book it is written of me, I have come to do thy will, O God. Talking about Jesus. And what 1,500 years of burnt offerings and sacrifices couldn't do, Jesus did it in a mere six hours on the cross one day. And then he sat down on the throne where all the priests offering sacrifices in that day would never have a chair to sit in the holy place because their work was never done. And after 1,000, after 15 centuries, they couldn't do it. And God wasn't pleased. And Jesus said, I'm coming to do your will. I've come to please you. And boom, one sacrifice, one day on the cross, he sits down with the work finished and he's so full of faith. And we got to, Paul said, I live by the faith of the son of God. We need to live by, he even gives us his faith. He sits down at that right hand throne, like Psalm 110 verse one says, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And Hebrews tells us, that he sits expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. He's sitting there. He listened to the word of the Father, and he's believing it. And he's sitting there expecting. He said, you sit, I'll bring your enemies down. You don't even have to put your enemies under your feet. I'll do it. You sit, and I will put your enemies beneath your feet. And he's expecting till his enemies be made his feet. We need to believe the word like he did. And the grace that he offers to us isn't just a co-death with him isn't just a co-burial and a co-resurrection, which is what salvation starts with, but it's a co-believing and a co-faith that he gives us in his grace. Where Paul said, I am crucified with him. And then he said, let me rephrase that. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I live by the faith of the Son of God. Galatians 2 and 20. My, oh my. So, Ararat means the curse is reversed. And Noah got the covenant and a token of the rainbow was established to indicate that covenant every time a cloud would come. Isn't that beautiful? It reminds you of that. During this time, if it happens to rain where you are, look for that rainbow and think of what I'm saying. Because that rain and that dark cloud, that's kind of like what we're going through now. And really, the whole world is going through it. Talk about Noah's day. And in every trial you face, there's victory. God's throne is there for you. God remembers the covenant with you. But it so often happens that believers forget. They forget that they can go to that throne. They handle the storm themselves. Jesus was with the disciples in the ship when the storm came, when those clouds came, when the rain came. They forgot who they had with them. And they started fearing. And we often forget who's with us in this storm. And we fear and we fret. Hebrews 4 tells us that we read about finding grace to help in the time of need. If you go before chapter 4 into Hebrews 3, the very last half of Hebrews 3, well, let's look at it. You need to see these verses. He's talking about Israel going through a time of fear. When they were going through, he said, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation. That meant times they provoke God. In the day of temptation in the wilderness. We're going through a time of temptation. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works. They tempted me. They proved me. God proved he was with them. He got them out of Egypt. He brought down Pharaoh and broke his back and, and got them out of the kingdom power present in the earth that, that day. 
and, and saw his works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their hearts, they have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it's called today, and that's why I'm here right now. I'm, I'm exhorting you, lest at any time you be any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Because we're made partakers of Christ. We, we enjoy his victory, his co-faith, his, all, all of his blessings, his grace, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. We say, oh, well, I'm just weak. I'm slipping up and he didn't take that attitude with them in the wilderness when they looked, well, the giants are there and the walls are there. Oh, well, we made a mistake. I guess we're not going in. No. He said, they provoke God, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Thank God for Joshua and Caleb. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believe not, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So when you read chapter 4, and you read, let us therefore fear, keep what he said at the end of chapter 3 in mind. Don't fear like they did, because the gospel is preached to them as well as us. And then he says, instead of that, go to the end of chapter 4. Go boldly to the throne of grace next time. They could have gone, in fact, the Ark of the Covenant was right there. And the Ark was a symbol of God's throne on earth, the mercy seat. God would speak. The holiest of holies was a throne room. And the ark was right there. And, and atonement by a sacrifice on the day of atonement with the blood sprinkled on the ark was God being with them. That's what made it possible for God to be with them. So here you have the ark sitting right there in the camp. And then Joshua and Caleb are, are screaming it out. You couldn't hear it any easier. God is with us. God is with us. What took them through the Jordan 40 years later? Joshua taking the ark through. The ark was right there. The, take those giants down. Take those walls. In fact, the ark did take the walls down 40 years later when they marched around Jericho with that ark. So the ark represents God's with us. Folks, that's the throne. And notice in Ezekiel, there were cherubim who were carrying that uh, uh, sapphire throne on the crystal firmament with Jesus sitting up there with a rainbow around about it. Well, it's like, Put that upon your shoulders. Put him over your head like the cherubim were carrying him in royal procession because you're not just walking through a storm, folks. You're in royal procession with the king sitting on the throne and you're upholding him on your shoulders. And shoulder speaks of responsibility. Remember Saul was head and shoulders above everybody? They get the shoulder of a beast that they gave to him as an offering when Samuel came along and anointed him. That represents the government would be on his shoulders, like it says about Jesus. Shoulder this thing. Your responsibility is to lift him up high. And upholding your faith in trusting God while you go through this hardship is like putting the ark on your shoulder and upholding your faith. What are you upholding? It's the throne of God I'm upholding. What do you mean by that? Jesus is on that throne. He said, I'm to go to him at that throne anytime I need help. He'll give me grace in the time of need. And I'm going through this Jordan and he's going to open it up. Praise God. And I'm going around that Jericho and he's going to tear those walls down. And the very things that feared, caused fear in them 40 years earlier, they overcame them because of the concept, God is with us. God is with us. God is with us. And that ark being carried with them meant all of that. Oh, we saw so many messages about the Ark of the Covenant in that sense. And so that ark is mobile. That throne is mobile. That's why there was a wheel within a wheel that Ezekiel saw, and that glory was on its way, coming. Praise God. Over and over again, you see these things in the Word of God trying to give us strength. And so Hebrews 4, talking about going to that throne, was written after chapter 3, and the first part of chapter 4 said, you got to not provoke God, but believe. And go to that throne, because that's what it's there for. God was with Israel in that storm of unbelief that day. They saw the giants, but they doubted that God was with them. And God's with us through every storm. 
Just as sure as there's a rainbow in every cloud, God's with us in every storm. And if the rainbow is an idea of we're coming out of the storm and it's associated with the throne of God, His throne's right there with that rainbow. Think of Revelation chapter 4 when you read next time. Uh, When you think, rather, of a storm with a rainbow at the other side. Each of you have to reach out to him for help, though. You know, we're quoting all these scriptures. And we're saying, no plague shall overcome you. No plague shall come nigh thy dwelling place. But you've got to have faith in that. You just can't think it's going to automatically happen. You've got to believe. You've got to read that, get faith in it, and then expect it. Look for it. Because, boy, I sure hope this is going to work. He said, no plague will befall me. Guess what? Not going to work. You've got to have faith in it for it to work. So don't just pull little purple and fluorescent cards out of a little bread container and say, I got a promise from God. Believe what that says. And then go through it with that kind of faith. And then no plague will befall you. Praise God. We forget God is there remembering his covenant. But we've got a part to do too. We've got to remember it. And we've got to have faith in that word. David found five smooth stones in a valley. Talk about going through a hard time. This guy was in a valley. And once again, there was a giant down there, just like Israel faced giants in the promised land. And But there's a river that was in that valley too. And as sure as there's a rainbow in every cloud, there's a river in the valley. And the river is the flowing of God's spirit. And from that flowing of God's spirit, that's where he found his weapons. He wasn't using the swords, the shields, the spears and armor of all that the army had that Saul tried putting on him. He got what that river provided. And in the moving of the spirit, you'll find that. And those stones were there. And he was able to use them and come against that giant and bring him down. So, Valleys are dark, just like clouds depict darkness. But there's a rainbow in every cloud, and the Spirit's flowing in every valley. Now, what's interesting is in Ezekiel 1, there was a throne, just like in Revelation 4 that I showed you, and just like Isaiah 6. In fact, I was called to God in a little Bible study in a church in Mississauga, Ontario, by reading Isaiah chapter 6, and God told me to stand up and tell everybody, I had just called you, son. And it was Isaiah 6. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. And when the last part of that chapter said, who will go for me? He said, I will, I will. And that's when God called me to the ministry. I'll never forget it. But it's often been so significant to me later in these years because I realized that's where the throne was. And the seraphim you read about were above upon the throne. That's like the carabim over the Ark of the Covenant. And, and Revelation had the caribbean there, the lion, the ox, the eagle, and the man. Four beasts of Revelation. And, and those caribbean were at the entrance of the Garden of Eden by a flaming sword blocking that way. And that sword that they were beside was the Word of God, Christ, on the throne. It's like the Ark of the Covenant was there. It's like the throne was there. The voice of God was there. And only the high priest could approach that throne to get into the holiest. But now all of us can go in. We can all go boldly to that throne. The Jewish high priest, he feared and he trembled when he approached the mercy seat throne. But we can come boldly. He he, he was so careful because he had to make sure the offering was done right. Well, you don't have to make sure if Jesus' offering was done right or not. He was not only the high priest... He was a sacrifice that offered himself and carried his own blood, according to Hebrews chapter 9. And in that storm, folks, we can have boldness. We're going right to that holiest of holies in this time. See, not only did the old covenant people fear going through a storm, like the giants in Canaan, they even the high priest even feared going to the throne, but we need not fear in either of those situations. We're under a new covenant, a better one. Praise God. And we come in faith knowing that he will not be destroyed. We won't be destroyed, rather, because the throne is there with us. Oh, folks, we need to believe the word of God so much that we go to God in times like this. The throne also has some more information. I'm going to bring this down now. Jesus is seated above all powers in this world and the world to come. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 2, verse 6 says, 
we are seated with him. When we see a cloud, we know there's a rainbow in it. And we know that the throne is by the rainbow, or rather the rainbow is by the throne. And we know Jesus is on that throne. But let's just take this a little further. If you could possibly take it further, what else could there be? Here's what there could be. Know also that we are seated together with him on that throne. We can use the power. A lot of times people say, oh, Jesus, please heal. Jesus, please do this. He said, wait a minute. You speak to this mountain and say thou unto it, be thou removed and cast into the sea. And if you doubt nothing, that's what I was saying about Psalm 91 and 10. No plague shall come nigh thy dwelling. If you doubt nothing, that will be true. But you've got to exert your faith. So are you hearing what I'm saying? You know, here's another way faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Through anointed ministry, through anointed teaching in the word, Jesus said, teach all nations. Through teaching, people are going to, it's exploding. I'm getting it in my heart. My heart's just exploding with faith now. It will give you an anointing to believe God. We even need his anointing to get that faith. And that's why the word's anointed. So that then you, you hear it. You get the message out of it. It's not just going in one ear and out the other. Two people can be sitting in church, hear the same word, and one guy's got no faith at all. But this person over here, there's fireworks going off in their hearts. Praise God. So you hear it. And so listen to this message God has for you. You're seated with him. You can use your authority. And you know what we need to do? In fact, I'm going to do this. Other ministers have started doing the same thing. We're going to rebuke this disease. We're going to rebuke this virus and tell it to get its hands off of this earth. He's given dominion to Adam. Adam lost it. Jesus Christ came as the last Adam. He's not going to reign, folks. He's been sitting on that throne for 2,000 years over all principalities and powers. Some people need to read the end of Ephesians 1, where he's already king of kings. And we need to use the authority he's given us and command this thing to leave. Climb on that throne with Jesus. Ride with him and rest, Hebrews said. There remaineth a rest to the people of God. Sit there and rest, and you can't rest until you expect your enemies to be brought under your feet. Not by your efforts. God said, you sit, son, and I will put thine enemies under thy footstool. Relax, take it easy, rest with him in power over this storm. Hallelujah. Talk about having victory. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this word. I thank you for victory, God. We've got power in your name, Jesus. You told us, you told us, you didn't tell us to tell you to do it. You told us to speak to this storm, to speak to this mountain and tell it to go into the sea. I, right now, folks, do this with me. Believe with me. One will put a thousand to flight. How many will put a, so many more to flight if two will put 10,000, just doubling it 10 times? How many are watching this? How many are going to watch this? If you just didn't log in while this was live, pray this prayer now and join it. If it happened three days ago to what you're watching now, it doesn't matter. Let's let build up a monument here. I command COVID-19 to leave this earth. I command it to leave the flesh of the humanity. I command it to take its hands off of this earth world. We have dominion with Christ. We're seated with him far above all principalities and powers. You foul devil, you spirit behind this, I command you to let go in the name of Jesus Christ now. I command you, I am seated far above you, devil. I'm seated far above you, disease. I'm with Christ far above all principalities and powers. And every name that is shaken, every name that rather that is named, including COVID-19. And I use my authority, not of myself, not in me and myself, but in the name of Jesus Christ, I use this authority and command it to leave every home now, leave our cities in Jesus' name. We command it in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah, God. Let's thank God right now. Let's give him praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I give you glory, God. I pray you spread this, like let, let, let this message go viral. Talk about a, a viral outbreak. Let a message like this go viral and spread across because faith is contagious too, not just fear. 
faith will splash off onto you. You get it from the word of God. You get it from others and you build yourself up and where two or three are gathered and, and we are lively stones built up a spiritual house. Let's build up a house of faith against this a disease from the pit and in the name of Jesus Christ. Let the rainbow shine, Lord, through this world. Jesus, you stopped that storm and you commanded it to be still and you commanded peace. We command it because you said these things that you do, would we do also because you're going to the Father. And when you went to the Father, Lord, you went up to that throne and you sat down and you became King of Kings and you were glorified to be Christ. Hallelujah and Lord. And now in Jesus name, we can do it because we're sitting with you. That's why you went to the Father, to sit. And we're sitting with you. That's why your throne is the throne of God. Not two thrones, but one. God and the Lamb and all us are seated together with you in Jesus' name. And we command like you did, God. Peace be still. In Jesus' name we command it. Oh, hallelujah. Take another look at this screen before you go and just thank God and worship him and share this video. Share this link. Let people hear it because this is the time to shine, folks. This is the time for us to shine. God bless you so much in Jesus' name.